Hello again, everyone, and welcome to our podcast, uh, our Empowering Equality podcast by Inclusive Workplace and Supply Council of Canada, or IWSCC uh, for short. My name is Deidre Guy, and I am the president and, and co-founder of IWSCC. If you happen to be watching this on YouTube, you'll see that we have ASL interpretation, and that has been sponsored by RBC and also provided by Maple's Communi Maple Communications Canada, and our podcasts are sponsored by Pod Supply. And I'm pretty excited today uh, as I learn more about these people. One, I know. Two, I'm just meeting, uh, but I got a chance, of course, to read their bios and look into some of the things that they've done, and pretty happy to be uh, having them on our podcast today. I know you're going to absolutely enjoy it. So I want to welcome uh, Kabilder Saran Caldwell, as well as Graham Kent and Ty Friedman to the show. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Thank you for having us. Hello. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks for being here. So I'll start with you, Kalbinder, because uh, you sort of brought everyone together here for the show today. Just tell me a little bit about yourself and what do you do and sort of what led you to um, deciding, we talked a lot, but what led you to suggesting this podcast, which is such a great idea? Uh, I'm uh, the CEO and founder of Real Life Pictures, Inc., which is a fully integrated production company as well as a literary agency representing diverse, neurodiverse, and LGBTQ writers and directors. So um, what really, uh, you know, made me think that this would be a good opportunity for us to talk um, with you is, you know, Graham was my first neurodiverse uh, writer that I brought on to the roster. And I really learned a lot from him. Um, and, you know, how to deal with individuals that are neurodiverse. And then I was identified as um, someone with an invisible disability. So there's a lot of learning around, you know, this community especially in the film and television um, industry, because it's fairly new. Even when I actually say the word neurodiverse, there is a number of people that ask me, what does that mean? Uh -huh. And so it really starts a conversation. Um, but really, Graham and Ty can speak from lived experience within this industry. Okay, well, why don't we jump then right through to Graham. Graham, tell us about yourself, who you are, and, and what you do now. Sure. Um, yeah, I, uh, well, I've, I've been in this industry for, uh, how old am I now? Gosh, almost two decades, I guess. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I started out as an actor and, and spent many, many years uh, pursuing that to varying levels of success. Um, and then turned to writing a while ago and um, was very, very fortunate to um, cross paths with Cool, uh, with cool Bender under an extremely odd and interesting set of circumstances that I won't really go into, but it involved a, a poorly handled uh, reply all uh, email thread um, that ended up in a Facebook group being formed. And um, oh, wow. here we are. Um, so it's it's a pretty interesting story. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I've been I've been writing for a while now, um, and I I am uh, neurodiverse. I do have Tourette syndrome, and um, yeah, as as Coolbinder says, I I was oh god, we go way back. I think I was maybe the second or something client that yeah. she signed, um, and uh, it's just been a tremendous relationship this whole time, and I've been so thrilled and lucky to to have her speaking on behalf of me and to be a part of something where she's now become a, a really recognized uh, in the community, I believe, champion of uh, people of, of many different types of um, disabilities, or as she said, the LGBTQ community as well. And so uh, it's been great. And I just wanted to add, Graham, you're, um, you were diagnosed early uh, in your life, right? Like your childhood I was... diagnosed? Yeah, I was diagnosed uh, when I was eight years old, um, so I've I've uh, had a long time to become very familiar with it and comfortable in my own skin with it, um, and I've been fortunate to talk to many different people uh, along the years since then about it, 
Um, and, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Forgive me if I'm <laughs> maybe not hitting all the all the markers you laid down. Yeah, that's great. No, that's great. Thank you, Graham. I appreciate that. And we'll dig into all of that a little bit later. Uh, but I did want to uh, switch it over to Ty. So Ty, tell us about yourself and uh, who you are and what you're doing now. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ty Friedman. I'm a, I'm a writer, um, sometimes performer, creator type. Um, I... Um, I focus mostly on children's media and animation. I love writing for, for young kids. I was also a teacher for a really long time. And um, it's one of my best skills is like making kids laugh. Um, so I try to do that in almost everything that I do. Um, and yeah, um, I am kind of on the other end of the spectrum. Oh, spectrum. Huh? <laughs> um, I'm on the other end of the spectrum where I... Um, I found out um, about, I got diagnosed with ASD uh, and autism um, fairly later in my life. And it's something that I've come to, that I've always kind of had in my life, um, that's always been part of me, but was kind of an answer to a lot of, a lot of questions I had about myself. And um, I was very lucky with, uh, with being a part of the film community. I almost immediately found community within um, through this program called Respectability. And also I found Colbender very early into my diagnosis and it's been kind of a wonderful supporter and that I've needed in order to feel comfortable and brave enough to go out there and be myself as a writer. Okay, so a couple things. I'd love to learn more from you and Graham about the respectability organization. I was looking into it and that's very cool. And Ty, I totally agree uh, based on uh, the pie guy that pizza is definitely for breakfast. Like, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but I'm not, a cold, I'm not a cold pizza for breakfast person. I gotta have that pizza warmed up, but it, you know. You'll do the work yeah. in order to warm yes. it up. That's yeah. impressive. Well, it's like true, I'm but it's not even that much work because <laughs> Uh, yeah, we bought. Whatever. I'm one of those air fryer purchaser people through the pandemic, and it's fixed uh, pizza in a way that ne nothing else has before. It's it's really revamped everything. It's true, and pizza in particular because warming it up in the oven, or I mean, I don't have a microwave, but when I did, I mean that didn't work. So oven is okay, uh, but air fryer is just so much better. It crisps it right <laughs> up. So so yeah, totally totally there. Uh, and I'm not opposed to having leftover Swiss chalet for breakfast too. I'm just going to put that out there. Well. <laughs> Great, great. Can't do it. Yeah, no, can't do it. Again, though, air, heated in the air, re reheated in the air fryer. Again, does beautiful things, the air fryer. For no, I'm fries. a BC girl, so we no never one. had Swiss chalet. Oh, okay. So when I first was introduced to it, sorry. Can't do it. Nope. I'm, no, yeah. can't. Yeah. And so do you have a Swiss chalet equivalent out of BC? Like I know in Quebec, there's Saint Hubert, uh, which is pretty close, but not the same in my opinion. Nothing like that out? No, I mean, there is something called White Spot that used to be a homemade sort of burger okay. kind of joint. Yeah. Um, but certainly not the phenomenon so we call Swiss Ballet. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm going to put this yeah. in front of them and see if I can get some kind of, I don't know, royalties or something. <laughs> so Graham and, Graham and Ty, tell us a little bit about this respectability organization, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. It's a... Um... So I started off in the, the filmmakers group. It's um, respectability is a what's a, what's a great way of, of describing them. I should have had that written out and prepared. But they're they're essentially they're like a wonderful collective of of filmmakers and creatives who they work within the film industry to do either consulting or um, placing placing people you know, in their, the, the film community who have disabilities, it's, um, it's for people with all types of disabilities and they created a filmmakers lab as a way to kind of bring people together, um, and, and meet other, other filmmakers and, you know, build community. And it's been, they've done about 10 years what? of respectability now, and they've, they've made their way into different, um, consulting gigs and then we've had many labs in this year so i did the filmmakers lab in 2021 and then in 2022 i did um uh th they partnered with netflix to do the children's content Ooh. lab where i got to do a showcase script reading in new york city which was amazing i bet yeah. hey graham anything to add and um i'll just add that a big part of what um helped me 
prepare to uh, get my submission together for respectability was was Ty actually because oh. he um, had a bit of seniority on me having done it the year prior and then I was part of the 2022 um, virtual uh, cohort so a bunch of us from around the world who met online kind of like this to do it um, although I don't think it was I think they just maybe they changed it or maybe it was something different but I guess I did the uh, virtual entertainment lab not necessarily a specific filmmaker's okay. lab um, but everything he said is is uh, is absolutely apt. Um, it's a, a bunch of people who, and, and the people who sort of form the um, the staff of respectability are all people who identify as having uh, disabilities themselves yeah. as well. So it's a really for us by us kind of thing. Um, I think their their slogan or something that they sort of attach to everything is like nothing about us okay. without us. Um, and I I really respect that approach as well that mantra. So uh, yeah, you it's it's kind of part lab, part networking, part information sessions. They'll bring in a lot of guest speakers and oftentimes people from large studios who will come and talk about their own DEI initiatives um, and what they're doing to sort of try to make changes within their own uh, their own organizations. Um, and we can ask questions and meet them and. Um, yeah, it was a phenomenal experience and remains a, an incredible mm -hmm. working relationship to this day. Right. And it's great. It's just community in a way that yeah. we like need, especially like for me, like it came at like a time when I just like found it, understood my right. disability and it like showed me just like 30 individuals who are incredible filmmakers who are ready to be working, who are, um, who are just like true artists. And I found it who also are interested in all the things I'm interested in and, it was able to show I was able to meet people that um, that were on the spectrum like me who I who were working already and and had already proved that it could work. So it's it's just it's it, it was a necessary thing for me to believe that that I could be out there. Fantastic. I just want to add it's a very competitive program, too. So both of them should be very, very proud, like I am of them, that they were. <laughs> part of these um, programs and they continue to have that relationship, you know, long after they, they've left. So yes, it's really, it's just important. Absolutely. Amazing. And, and that sense of community is so huge and so missing in the disability community. And, and I realized, and, and Kalinder, you were part of our first IWSCC's first national um, annual uh Forum for Disabled Entrepreneurs. You spoke for that, and thank you again for that. Uh, and that is part, and you are one of IWSCC's certified suppliers, which means what IWSCC does is we we help to uh, find and certify suppliers, business owners that are either disabled and or uh, a veteran. Often uh, veterans have disabilities. So the two are very, um, they intersect often. So you're certified as one of our uh, diverse suppliers and, and get introduced to all kinds of fantastic uh, companies in Canada that are looking to diversify their supply chain. What made you decide to certify with IWSCC? What made you decide to do that? Well, I actually was fortunate enough to be able to uh, apply for the CAN Export Fund, and uh, certification was one of the, um, you know, buckets, if you will, um, that we were allowed to become a part of, and then uh, be able to have uh, CAN Export, you know, sort of help us with the funding of it. And really, I hadn't been aware of uh, this type of certification sort of program. In the past, I've um, done a life coach certification program, even though I didn't need to, right? It, it's because it validates yourself and your business about um, policies and procedures that you are a part of. And so, so it was really that. Can Export sort of opened the door, but I got to say that IWSCC has really been life-changing for me because through this certification, I was able to, you know, really come out to say that I too am invisibly disabled. Um, as a leader in the industry, as a leader of a company, 
some of the things and being a, a female South Asian, you know, invisibly disabled uh, woman, I got a lot of ticks against me. So yeah. it's just like, um, do I even need one more? But really working with Graham and working with Ty and really learning from them, um, I was able to sort of stand up and say, I too am invisibly disabled. Sometimes I need a little bit of time to recover from, you know, um, a big strategy session or a big, you know, interview or something like that. And I had not allowed myself up until that point to give myself that space. Um, I've had three concussions. So it's post concussion syndrome that I'm dealing with. And it's something that not a lot of people are willing to sort of disclose for fear of that stigma. Of, mm -hmm. Okay, then she's not going to be able to do it. So, um, so yes, that was the reason why I became certified. And I'm, I'm such an active member. Mm -hmm. You are, we're really happy to have you. And it's been not even a year, I don't think has it? No, no, it hasn't. Year. Yeah. yeah, we've got lots going on at IWSCC. If you're a disabled business owner, come and check us out. You yeah. might be surprised at how much uh, you can, uh, you know, get, gain advantage for your business. Ty, I'm really interested. Every time I, I interview someone who talks about getting diagnosed late in life with any type of disability, invisible disability, they tell me what a difference it has made in their life and, and, and just in their mindset and, and how they how they see themselves. And would you agree that that's the case for you? Has it? Yeah, I mean, it definitely has. It, it was a big relief when I when I when it first happened. It was like it was I was able to, like, be kinder to myself in a way that I, you know, I, I really didn't probably need it at the time. It made me understand a lot of moments where I wasn't. I don't know, completely in control or um, able to, or moments where I was in kind of duress and, and was wondering why I had to, why I was not able to do what everyone else seemed to be so able to do so easily. Um, it also, you know, knowing about these challenges sometimes also makes them feel larger and it can be, you know, it's can something I'm still continuing to understand about myself. But I think, by being in the arts and by um, being in a in something that makes me excited to work and to feel that I that I you know feel compelled to create in, I think that that has given me a lot more permission to to focus on that um, that this this you know different beautiful brain is there's a reason for it and it creates really interesting things and it sees the world a little bit differently. And that's a perspective that seems very necessary often and something that, you know, people should include within their, with their staffs or whatnot. So um, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely a new, a new thing, but it's also kind of been a always been there part of my life as well. I just happened to have been, I was very lucky. I've been in a lot of spaces that really allowed me to be myself. I, I grew up in arts education. I, I've only had arts education, actually. I went to mm. um, boarding arts high school. I uh, went to, I got kicked out of two BFA programs. I ran away to clown school and <laughs> I, um, I just got my graduate degree in children's media. And so it's only been arts education. And that's been a big part of why I'm able to use these pieces of myself and and create with it um and to feel comfortable with it and so i try to be try to be as much myself as possible so that other people can do that as well and um that includes you know being open and and free with my disability and um having that be part of why i am the way i am so graham you were diagnosed quite young at eight. Do you have memory of that experience? And do you have memory of, of, you know, why you were diagnosed or any, any issues that were happening in your life at the time that led to that? Or is it uh, blissfully gone? <laughs> <laughs> um, th there's much of my childhood that I certainly don't remember. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the same. Despite my therapist's best attempts, I guess. No. Um, <laughs> but uh I, I do remember a little bit of that. I mean, there certainly, you know, I think my my parents started noticing 
um, that I was maybe having, uh, you know, some, some ticks earlier on. Um, and, and generally maybe it's changed since then, but, but back then, you know, the requirements for diagnosis, there had to be vocal ticks and motor ticks. Okay. Um, and I certainly did used to have both. Um, and I guess still do from time to time, but after a while, yeah, I mean, I think it just went the path of like, you know, where's this coming from? What's going on? We should sort this out, talk to a doctor, get referred, get referred again, specialists, et cetera. And then eventually someone, um, diagnoses you. And even though my diagnosis came much earlier in life, um, I think that I still felt, although maybe to a lesser degree, but I, I think I, I echo Ty's thoughts absolutely that I, I think it still felt very much like a, a relief even at, yeah. at such a young age. Um, I remember that I was in grade three and I, I had vocal tics at the time that were kind of like inhaling, but while simultaneously having to try and hit like a certain note okay. uh, on a scale. So I would have to be like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. something like that. And I yeah. would do this in class while the teacher was reading. And there was this kid who would always be like, can you stop that? You know, can you stop that? And finally I get diagnosed and I'm in class again one day. And I, and again, it was a relief like, oh my God, this, this isn't like my fault. It's nothing I can control. Yeah. It's okay. And I have We're an answer for all of this now. Um, and then next day in class, I'm doing it again. He's like, can you stop that? And I remember just like, just immediately bursting out like, no, I can't. And I ran out of the room, cried in the hall for a bit. Um, it was such like a, it was like such a catharsis, right? Oh, really? um, so yeah, I, I don't remember a lot around that. I remember asking my parents uh, if I was going to die because I oh. did not know that it was not fatal. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, just learning, learning more about it over time. So. So a little bit scary at the beginning. Oh, sure. I think as, yeah. as a kid, something that's, and I mean, it wasn't even like something that we had or that, or, or that I had kind of heard about maybe, but didn't understand. It was this totally new thing that uh-huh. I had never heard of before. Um, so yeah, there was definitely a, a, an immediate initial fear about what that meant and how serious was it. And then I learned, oh, no, no, it's okay. It's not, you know, it's not fatal. It's not like that, but it means this and it means this and I'm going to have to learn how to adapt in certain ways. Um, and I, and I agree again with Ty that, uh, you know, as you, as you emerge in a sort of artistic sense of yourself in an artistic world, like it does offer a different perspective, I think. Um, and I don't know necessarily specifically about Ty, but for me, I think just having grown up, in a way that felt like, because it's kind of different for me too, because I guess sometimes it's a visible disability, but it's also a non-visible disability. So it kind of depends on the day. Um, But growing up where you can very easily have kind of everyone looking at you, you're possibly disrupting the whole class and getting in trouble for it. Can't necessarily help it because when I'm much younger, I didn't know how to control my tics as well. and being made fun of constantly and all this kind of stuff builds. And I notice now in my writing, whether it's comedy or drama or whatever it is, um, a pretty recurring focus that I tend to put into my work is this sort of underlying concept of the kind of surface differences that we kind of put up between us, but that how at the end of the day, I, th- I think that we always work better uh, in cooperation than in competition. I think that we always yes. have more in common than in contrast um, and that we can just kind of kind of get really tripped up on all the sort of superficialities of it. So um, so that's definitely like played a big part in my work and uh, uh, in my writing. Yeah. So we're 25 minutes into this podcast and I've only asked the first official question on my list. <laughs> <laughs> So I think I'll 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 just sort of jump over here. And uh, this question is for Ty and Graham. Although uh, Kavinder, you're not off the hook yet. But um, you guys write for a range of genres, including drama and comedy, uh, children and young adults. What's what's your favorite genre, and why? Why is it your favorite? Ty, do you want to go? Yeah, I mean, mine is definitely uh, children's 
is like the audience that I'm most interested in. Although I do kind of, I, I do love to write in, in other genres, kind of wherever the story comes. But I think it's so important to write for, for kids. I think it's, um, I, I think there's, it's a way to gr- create great change. I think if you get to, I'm, I'm a big product of the media that I watched as a kid as the Mr. Rogers and the, the Sesame streets, the, they, they really helped me become a kinder and more empathetic person. And I think that was, so I think the media that we, we ha- give to the kids to consume, it really has a large impact on their lives to show them what, um, you know, different people can look like and that everything is kind of okay. I think that's so important. And I think, um, so that's one of the ways that I like to enact change is my own little, not that I'm trying to like indoctrinate your children with like, with like good values, but (laughs) cooperation and empathy. I know. (laughs) But I think there's, there's like really great, um, you know, it's something that I, I take, um, a lot of care with because oh. I know that it's an important um, role that I get to play in some kids' lives who might watch any of my stuff. So would you say that writing for yourself, uh, for your own stuff is different than writing for other people? What, what would be the differences if so? Oh yeah, I think, well, I do tend to like write to the world that I that I wish to see right. a lot of the times. I think, I think for me, I'm, constantly trying to understand the world a lot of a lot of people make choices that i don't quite under i don't see why they do it that way like i can i have such like values that like like i can't even believe sometimes so i so a lot of times i am writing to the world that i that i wish to see and um and show and kind of makes sense. i use it a lot to make sense of the world and so right. I, when i'm writing for myself i'm making sense for my of me why, um, you know, I, in a conversation that I didn't quite understand how, why it went the way that it did, I can understand through it. In fact, yeah. I mean, I was, before I even was diagnosed, it was through the writing where I was kind of writing for myself and trying to understand. And I was working on this script that um, was about a school for kids with disabilities that had a lot of um, neurodiverse characters in it. And I, as I was doing my research, I that's where I was able to understand myself yes. and my disability and so it's um so yeah it, it's always been writing for myself is a way that i've learned to make sense of the world and i think it's kind of a way that it's kind of an entry point it doesn't mean i can't like write for other characters in fact i i do that a lot They're but wrong. i do it for all the kids who i teach i, I steal every single one of them and i i turn them into, <laughs> into kids. Like a lot of times there will, you'll find in a lot of my work, maybe like a teacher character or a funny adult kind that you could kind of see, oh, this is probably the, so-and-so the, the type onto it. <laughs> Graham, what about you? What's your favorite genre to write for? Um, my favorite genre is drama. Drama. Yeah. And so you mostly write for drama and thriller. Would that be safe to say? Uh, but well, with- I would say drama and comedy. Yeah, if you want to get Obviously. specific within the drama, I mean, Brenda yeah, I write a lot of comedy well. too. Sorry, did, I, did you say drama and comedy? Yeah, those are my two. Yes, okay. But if I had to pick one, I'd probably steer a little more towards drama, even though Ty's Ty's not half wrong. I, uh, yeah, I went. I went to college. <laughs> I didn't quite run off to clown school. But I was very, very close. I did go to comedy writing, uh, comedy writing and performance okay. at Humber, um, and uh, certainly spent a lot of time as well doing a lot of sketch and improv and stand up. Um, so that's definitely a big part of my background. Um, yeah, that's great. So um, we were both actors first, so like the drama of it all yeah. is like very appealing. Like you know, like. It, yeah. Even though we're funny people, we, we want to like make people upset and cry and understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get the feels yeah. and the emotions. <laughs> so I was just going to ask what makes comedy different uh, than writing for other genres. Uh, and then, uh, and then when you, when you add in there comedy for children. So Graham, do you write comedy for children as well as adults? Um, not as much the, the, okay. the writing for younger audiences that I've done. I mean, I think just because it is geared towards a younger audience, you're probably more inclined to have some comedic moments here and there. 
just by nature of, of the genre because it's entertaining and it helps keep them engaged um, and it's light. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think Ty is probably more on the uh, comedy for children writing. I, my, my comedy is quite inappropriate for a young audience. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I would say so. <laughs> Ty, Ty does a great job getting the kids ready for life. And then when they grow up and realize how terrible it is, that's where I come yeah, in. No, I'm kidding. Then you, uh, you pop know. in. Yeah. <laughs> so this question is for Yuko Bender. You've made a, a business out of representing writers and helping to share their stories. Are there some kinds of stories that are your favorites and, and that you would like to see more of out there? So I have to say that, um, no, there's, uh, I love all of my writers and um, all of their lived experiences come out so well in everything that they write that are originals and <clears throat> which makes it really easy for me to sort of pitch that. Uh, because it's a very well-formed POV, and it's also about their lived experience. So when I'm uh, trying to get staffing opportunities uh, for the writers, having that uh, for both Ty and Graham, even though Graham doesn't write for kids, as a staffing opportunity, because they're both neurodiverse and because they have a comedy background, I can then pitch them for those kids' television staffing opportunities. So that's what I love um, is just really understanding who the writer is and then just going out there and bragging like a proud mama bear, you know, to everybody. Did you know what my, my <laughs> grand did? Here's my you know, picture. Just, do you know what my guy did, you know, and what he's writing about and stuff like that. And that just makes it a joy, you know. So it's not one particular genre, you know, where kids is better than comedy or dramedy or uh, drama. It's really about the storyteller. And I, oh, I think that I'm okay. very, very fortunate that I have a fantastically talented storytellers that are on the roster. And um, yeah, so I'm happy. Yeah. So I, I'm curious to know how the, the business behind this works, like from your end of things, Kalender. Uh, do do the guys say here's a story or do you have uh, people who say I need a writer to write this type of story like how does that all come together how do you match the people uh it's very important for me to match the right creator and right story to the right producer um okay. because it's a it's a long-term relationship and mutually beneficial and everybody understanding what the goal is the end goal is what is the show what are the characters what's the world like and do we are we on the same page with that so um so really there's two different ways that graham and um ty can get work through me okay one is staffing and historically Kids Television has been wonderful about supporting new and emerging, diverse, neurodiverse, and, and queer um, writers. So um, that's really where I started off and where, um, you know, my gratitude is, you know, um, so much. And then the other side is, so Graham has been staffed on a kids show same with Ty. On the other side, they have stories that they want to tell, which is what we call original IP. It's a, uh, it's a project that they have written, created the, the characters, the world, the story. And then I take that and try to um, get a production company to option it 
in order for them to move forward with the broadcaster and eventually get it greenlit into production. And for that, Graham has done both drama and comedy. And Ty has uh, a very personal story about his grandmother that is a beautiful love story from when they were 14 years old to um, many, many years um, past. So that's not kids for him, right? It's more of YA into adult. So, So those are the kind of stories that they give to me. I read them, we workshop them, and then... I start pounding the pavement and trying to find those marriages with the, the producers. <laughs> yeah. Not just dating, you know, we're into yeah, long-term get... commitment here, you know, not just. <laughs> There's <laughs> paperwork dating. involved. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> paperwork. Yeah. yeah. Well, Tinder does a lot of things within the agency that really prepare us to be ready for when we are in those staffing situations or when we are. Okay. Staffing. She gets us, um, she, she, we do these, um, these readings with the entire, with the entire agency where we get to, uh, workshop some of our work. Um, and then just, there's just general community and she's great about, um, developing alongside with you, some of the work that you do so that you're ready for it. And so it's, it's very important in, as people are emerging, we're getting these opportunities for our first time to then show up ready to work. And so gives us those chances and gets us where we need to be, which is so nice and so wonderful. <laughs> those meetings have got to be quite stressful. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Are you used to them now? They just whatever. They're fine. That's a really good question. Are they fun? <laughs> I think they're kind of fun actually, because yeah. and especially, I mean, I think for when they're, when you're coming in as yourself, I think, that and you're sh- giving showing up with your full self it's there's not much you can you know be f- fearful of it's it's already what's there yeah. so yeah i think i'm not very I'm, I enjoy it. <laughs> that's a very important statement ty yeah when you really think about that when you show up as your full self there's nothing to be fearful oh, and yeah. so many of us don't do that yeah. well, you know both of you have spoken uh and and Kalinder, um actually let me ask you this, Kalinder. Do you think that your disability has contributed to the work that you're doing now? Has it helped you? Has it held you back? Is there an effect? Uh, I think that it has helped me because um, it allows me to be able to put myself into Graham and Ty's shoes really? and really understand um, what is kind of needed from my perspective so I can articulate it to the producers, right? So when they're in a staffing room or it, when they are having that interview, you know, and then they um, don't get a immediate response, right? I can sort of walk them through that because... Mm. I'm the impatient type as well. Just like, okay, I haven't heard, I haven't heard, you know, like, so, so, but it, that took a while. Like Graham really taught me about that and, Mm -hmm. and language too, you know, like what is the language that producers use on a regular basis that may not be able to be fully communicated. I think that one of the uh, things is, is that I'll be in touch. You know, those are producers say that all the time, but people in general say that all the time as well. Is this like from an interview sort of perspective, if you're going in for a job interview. So as a neurodiverse individual, it's just like, we, we need finite answers, right? Not vague, you know, um, things like I'll be in touch. Okay. If you say that you're going to be in touch, when are you going to be in touch? And Mm -hmm. if you're not in touch, do I read into that, that it's, you really don't like me and you don't want to be working with me sort of thing. So that took a while 
for me to be able to understand that the verbiage that is industry-wide needs to be understood about the audience that you're speaking to no. in order for that communication. So communication's huge. It's yes, absolutely same. huge. And so I can then step in and, um, you know, speak to that producer and Ooh. educate them. But I also can understand the anxiety that sort of builds up sometimes when you're expecting something and it doesn't happen at that mm -hmm. time. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. mm -hmm. that's very interesting. And and so Ty and Graham, you both have shared uh, so far in this conversation ways that your disability has been helpful to you with your work. Um, are there ways that you feel that it may have held you back or has been hurtful for you? Um, as a writer, I think it's hard for me to say that if it has that I've known about it. Okay. Um, as an actor, I know it definitely did. Uh, when I when I would share that I have Tourette syndrome, uh, I think a number of times, you know, people would think, "Well, are they going to be able to perform this part?" Then mm -hmm. um, there was a a live show that I did back in high school that toured around, um, and not just a live show where when you're not in a scene you get to go back into the wings, but the artistic choice of the director was that when you're not in a scene, you're actually just kind of like in a in tableau you're still on stage in view so i i wouldn't have any break i wouldn't have any chance to like get any ticks out i'd have to hold everything in for like a solid 70 minutes every time we're doing this show and i learned from one of the fellow castmates later that something i said to the director because they knew each other uh, outside um that something i said to the director in the audition is what tipped the scales for him is that during my audition and i made this known but i also said like, look, if my character doesn't have Tourette syndrome, then I can't have Tourette syndrome either while I'm doing it. And that made him feel confident enough to cast me in that role. But it was still a concern of his. I know that there have been other times where the stigma uh, surrounding Tourette syndrome has been strong enough where it has made the difference for them. And I have not been really? given an opportunity to discuss that. Um, and a lot of that, a lot of those presum presumptions about the condition and they're thinking, okay, he's not going to be able to hold in his ticks or he's going to be swearing all the time. Uh, in my experience comes from certain pop culture pieces of, of entertainment, certain films and, and shows that I, I won't name right now, but there's plenty out there. And I've certainly heard a lot of people who have said that that's basically been their education of my condition. So uh, just further to everything we're talking about, why it's so important to get people with these lived uh, experiences on the creative side and um, and correcting the narrative and and uh, doing away with those uh, those those silly ridiculous beliefs. biases and stigmas, yeah. which is one of the reasons Absolutely. that IWSCC even exists in the first place, uh, is because you know I I am aware uh, living with PTSD myself that uh, there is so much stigma surrounding that and in, in, in the business world, of course, and in the work world. Uh, you know, I remember so many times needing the day off and just pretending I've got a cold or something, you know, because I couldn't mm. share exactly what was going on and, in fact, have been mm. fired as as a result of, of sharing right. that information. What about you, Ty? Has and it I, held you back? And, oh, sorry, Graham, go ahead. No, if it's okay, I was actually yeah. just going to ask you, because you mentioned that I've also uh, – I've also lost jobs once I've uh, disclosed that I have Tourette syndrome. But do do you find? Because I'm thinking I do. An open question for everyone. But because I think we all feel like the stigma attached to these disabilities, people think that it is going to make us incapable <laughs> of certain things. And maybe in some cases that's the truth. But I think in many other ways, do you also feel though that your disability or your experience from that actually makes you? more capable of other things yes. that actually maybe other people would not be capable of. Absolutely. And, and I don't think anyone's ever asked me a question on the podcast before. So thank you for that. Um, it <laughs> absolutely well. does. Uh, it's allowed me to have much more empathy for other humans than mm -hmm. I think I ever would have had. Uh, I now know how to compartmentalize really well. So when things are going on around me, you know, I'm having the coffee when the kitchen's burning down behind me, that's me. I'm just yeah. relaxing and, you know, watching a podcast. So uh, and so those are things that I've learned as a result of my uh, disability that 
that are positives. Um, you know, I often say, I wouldn't want to have this have happened to me the way that it did because it came from a significant amount of trauma uh, all through my teen years. Uh, so I certainly wouldn't want to have it happen this way, but there definitely have been some good things. I would say realistically, I, I'm happy with the human that I am now and certainly happy that I was able to, to take the, those lemons and make a, you know, a, a reasonable lemonade. Yeah. Um, but I do mourn the life I might have had. Now, I think it's just like a really good barometer of other people of how they if, if you, you know, tell them who you are and they treat you in a certain way that's different. I think it makes it very easy to be like, oh, not my not my type of person, yeah. or, um, which yeah. is kind of a nice gift, if you ask me. Um, good point. I think, yeah, I mean, it's 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 difficult to walk around in this world anyways, but to do it in a world that's not quite designed for you, it's just yeah. it's it's. Yeah. even harder but you, you also have to know what the gifts that you do give like what Graham yeah. says I think there's so many that come through there Clinder. I think that that's really um, that's a really good barometer to have Ty and I gotta say that that is that's really um, I think my superpower really mm. right it becomes because you can then really find out who's comfortable in their own skin and they are willing to lean into all of their talents and all of who they are, their lived experiences, their POVs, you know, what their kind of representation is of their entire self. And I found that you know, over the years working with a lot of different writers, it's those that are not really comfortable in their own skin makes it the hardest for me to represent them okay. because, because that's my super uh, power of me being able to really understand Graham inside and out and really understand Ty inside and out and really understand where they are going to succeed and where they're not, you know, and if they're, if that's something that they want to pursue, what I have to do to support them in that sort of um, uh, um, place. And those that I haven't been allowed to do that, that's when it becomes difficult, right? It, it, it's not as, it, it's not a match, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that you're right. That is something that has, because I recognize this as a, uh, my disability that I mm. had to kind of, um, enhance that part of who I am. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to ask a question I haven't asked in a few podcasts in a row now, but it's when I asked a lot at the beginning, <clears throat> um, that I'm going to look for a, a quick answer from each of you. Um, and okay. that is, if you found a, 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 a genie, a bottle with a genie in it, and there was only one wish left, uh, and that wish had to do with Canadians in the area of disability and business, what would your one wish be for Canadians who are in business with a disability? What would that be? Who's ready to go first? I can. All right. Um, I think I answered this the last time around as yes. well. It's just like be be comfortable enough in yourself um, to yell it from the rooftops, right? Like you're, this is who I am, you know, whatever you may call as flaws or, uh, and all, you know, but I'm, I'm invisibly disabled and that's Yay. who I am, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Yeah, I think very similar to that. I would want everyone to, you know, be able to be themselves as much as possible, but also that the um, that there's an appetite for to hear from these types of stories. Mm. Yeah, Graham. Um, I think my answer is probably a little broader, just to all industries. I would say, uh, in regards to hiring um, and who your staff is. Uh, don't presume anything. Um, if if someone is disclosing that they have some sort of disability, 
don't pretend like you have any idea what that actually might mean for them and in turn to you uh, and your company. Be willing to uh, you know, interview, speak with whatever. You have no idea what that means or how it could uh, turn out, how it could translate. Mm, I love that. I've really, really enjoyed this conversation today. Guys, thank you so much for being here. I, I appreciate you taking the time and, and sharing your lives and your stories with thank us. You. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, Deidre. So for everyone watching or listening, thank you for joining us again today. Um, be sure to like and subscribe uh, for more supplier diversity content with our podcast. If you want more information about IWSCC in general and what we do to support disabled and veteran-owned businesses, you can visit us on our website at www.iwscc.ca. Um, I'd like to once again thank Pod Supply for producing uh, these podcasts, as well as RBC for uh, sponsoring our ASL and uh, Maple Communications for providing the a ASL. Uh, once again, like and subscribe our podcast. We're trying to build our numbers. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you again.